My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hello, my name is Brian Miles, and I am very excited to share with you my favorite leadership quote is from my father. His name was Dale Miles, and it was that you stand for something or you fall for everything. And I've carried that quote in my heart pretty much since the day he shared that with me when I was a kid. And the second leadership quote that I love is from my pastor, Andy Stanley, from North Point Church here in Atlanta. And he said that leadership is a stewardship and that it's temporary and that we're accountable. And I've always carried that with me in terms of leadership, recognizing that I'm here for a season as a CEO of this company. I'm to be the best steward of this business I possibly can. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become irreplaceable, game-changing leader assistants. This is episode 32. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 32. As my son Weston said, you can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com forward slash 32. In case you haven't checked out our Facebook group, you can join at facebook.leaderassistant.com. And lastly, sign up for our email list so that you can get the latest podcast episodes, blog posts, online course resources, and live event notifications are straight to your inbox. You can sign up at leaderassistant.com forward slash sign up. Today, I'm speaking with Brian Miles, who's the co-CEO and co-founder of Belay Solutions. Belay Solutions is the largest virtual assistant firm in the U.S. with all U.S.-based VAs. And Brian has a great story of how they started the company and how to build a virtual culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast Today's guest is Brian Miles from Belay Solutions. Brian is the co-CEO and co-founder with his wife, Shannon. Brian, thanks for joining us. Jeremy, thank you for the opportunity. I'm thrilled to be here. So let's kind of take a step back and tell us about your very first job. My very first job was working at a Michael's. It's an arts and crafts store. And I was hired to be a stock boy. So I unloaded trucks. I priced merchandise. I put that merchandise on shelves. I swept floors. I cleaned restrooms. I went and got carts. Um, I helped people out to their cars. And that was in Southern California in San Diego, a small town called Poway. Uh, But that was my first official job. So what did you learn in that job that you still use today? I learned that I never want to clean restrooms ever again. (laughs) That's what I learned. I learned that there's got to be a better way to make a living uh, than what I was doing. And there's no no offense to anybody that's a janitor or anything like that. I just I realized that wasn't my calling. Uh, But uh, I I would tell you that um, you know actually I learned a value of hard work there. You know because I um, at the time it was in high school I had to I played soccer I played competitively so. Um, I also had to have a job to pay for you know, my car, my insurance and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I realized that nothing was going to be handed to me, that if there was something I wanted out of this life, I was going to have to go get it myself, that I, there was no hero coming to save me, that I was going to have to make that happen on my own. So um, I, I think that's what it, it, it taught me was the value of, you know, the value of hard work incrementally over time brings you success. Hmm. So. Fast forward a little bit, when and why did you decide to start Belay Solutions, which formerly known as EA Help, uh, which is a virtual assistant uh, company? That's a giant leap in time. A lot of water between. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so um, leading up to uh, starting our business in 2010, in the fall of 2010, my wife and I were um, in really nice jobs and and we had good careers. Um, The the problem for me was I was traveling too much and our children were two and five and, you know, they were littles and I just never got to see them. I was working for a really great company that I loved. 
I used to build and renovate churches for a, a really well-established you know, four-decade-old company. Um, but I was taking anywhere from six to eight flights a week, and I just was never home. And um, at the same time, my wife was working for a Fortune 10 company called McKesson, and she had been there for 10 years in a senior project management capacity, and her next career move was going to be more of a lateral move. And we just kind of hit a point where we just said, you know, are we – are we good doing this for someone else or should we consider something else? And kind of together over the course of the summer of 2010, we did a lot of due diligence. We asked people that were wildly successful in business what they thought, because we weren't going to ask people who were in jobs because they all thought we were nuts to consider leaving during the height of the great recession to do something like this. But the ones that we wanted to really kind of lean into were the ones that were successful in business and they all, for the most part said, yeah, you need to do this. This is the right time to enter the market. So um, with some courage, we walked in October 1st of 2010, and we both, within an hour of each other, resigned from our companies. And we um, took then $160,000, which was all of our 401k money, and we used that as our personal startup capital. And then December 1st, after we finished our jobs well, December 1st of 2010, we started what would become Belay, uh, and offer virtual assistant services and some other virtual services. So how did you decide to do the virtual assistant route? Yeah, so when I worked at my old company, um, I had an assistant. Her name was Trisha. And Trisha was a virtual assistant, but that was before you called him a virtual assistant. She lived in Charlotte, and I lived in Atlanta. And I saw her maybe... 10, 12 times a year, but for the most part, it was very much remote. And she managed uh, my sales team, which I had about 10 guys that I was responsible for in, in construction all over the U.S. And she, from Charlotte, kind of helped me oversee a lot of what happened. And I never rarely saw her. So I'm like, oh, that's a that's a virtual assistant. And then um, during kind of that season where I was feeling disrupted to start something, um, I read 4-Hour Workweek. And at that time in the book, it basically pointed to all overseas solutions. There was no domestic solution available. And I thought, you know, there's got to be something here in the States. There's a lot of people that need jobs right now. I have friends that need jobs right now here in the U.S. So what if we created a virtual assistant company that just purely focused on domestic staffing or, or, or folks here in the U.S.? And that's, that's basically what we did. Hmm. So how long did it take for you to really get to the point? where you were confident that it was going to work out? Uh, about seven months into our business. So we, so we kind of launched, uh, you know, late 2010 and w around the summer of 2011, I had one of our clients text me and say, Hey, um, a little known guy named Michael Hyatt is tweeting uh, I don't, does anybody use Twitter anymore except the president, uh, <laughs> was tweeting that he needed a virtual assistant. So I jumped on and I just messaged him and said, Hey, I own a virtual assistant company. And then he followed me and we DM back and forth and I set up a phone call for him. And then we talked for about 20 minutes. He signed the following morning and tweeted about us. And my inbox literally filled up with sales leads from every possible industry you would ever imagine. And that was a turning point in our business. It was, I call Mike, Mike and Gail had become good friends of ours. And it was like our Oprah moment, you know, when you get on the Oprah show and she talks about your book, you know, it was, it was that moment for us that really kind of took us in a whole different direction. We were, we were marching along, but what that enabled us to do was take our company and literally make it to break even in 14 months. So we didn't get paid back our investment, but we got the break even where the bleeding stopped at 14 months in our business. In a large part because Mike was kind enough to want to love our service, but to say nice things about us in the market. And then, you know, fortunately today, we've got a lot of great mics that are out there that say nice things about us, including our awesome clients. But it was 14 months, and I just remember that relief that it gave me when I, um, you know, when I when I felt that. You know, I looked at that spreadsheet and I said, oh, my gosh, I think we're we're going to make it. There's there was some wind in my sails that day. Hmm. So at that point, 
you probably were you were very excited and there's wind in your sails, but you were also, you know, when Michael Hyatt tweets and, and you get all these emails, you're probably also freaking out a little bit saying, well, I've got to find <laughs> assistance for, yeah. to, for these well, clients. <laughs> well, the first thing was I had to sell these folks, right? Oh, and right. Then there was this, you know, virtual assistance back then. And, you know, I say it like it was, you know, in the 1940s, but back then, it was still a lot of education. People are like, okay, how does this work? And, you know, it was just the head scratching today. It's so much, the, the industry has changed so much so that people just kind of already know to some extent what it is. But back then it was a lot of education. I sold every deal in our, in our company for 18 months until I couldn't keep up. And that was one of the first things I decided to outsource or excuse me, delegate inside my business. I, I handed that off around 18 months into our company. Um, but I would say that, on top of selling, yeah, the next thing was creating a really robust conveyor belt of great people that could represent our clients. So how did you find the quality assistance for your clients? Well, you know, we looked in places where we already had success with finding great virtual assistants. You know, we, we target college-educated stay-at-home moms and dads with past business pro- professional experience. And um, that's a really great target for us. We First off, I love stay-at-home moms and dads because for, I personally feel like corporate America has marginalized them, and it's unnecessary because they're really great, talented people. They just don't want to come work in an office every day. And then another great segment that we found are the kids of aging parents. They are highly qualified folks, but they have to be near their mom and dad to take care of them. And so that's just a groupings of people. We just started kind of aggressively going after and asking questions of our assistants like, hey, do you know other people? You know, so it, it, we tried to do our best to kind of create a referral system as well. Uh, and, and today it's very lively inside our organization. But we, you know, we're always on the hunt and advertising in areas where we feel like we can target those types of folks. So when you kind of get applicants, do you use tests or personality tests or some sort of assessments to match, you know, with the right assistance or or? Maybe I'm sure there's a there's a vetting process for one, but then you've got to match them to the clients. So what what yeah. kind of tools do you use or systems do you use for that? Well, a lot of that's our secret sauce. So <laughs> what I will say is this: is that we are robust in terms of how we vet our candidates that want to represent our company. Um, today we get over 2,000 resumes a month hmm. that come in our doors for people that would like to work for us, and we really truly pick the best of the best to represent our clients. Um, because, be, um, you know, belay is more than just virtual assistants. We have virtual bookkeepers and also website support specialists as well. So that 2000 kind of represents all of those resumes, but we have specific tests that we do per that type of service line or the person that wants to represent us. Um, we do video interviews, so it's important that you show up well, um, in terms of, you know, how you're going to interview, coming to an interview, not in your bathrobe. Just as a personal example, Mm -hmm. I would encourage you not to do that. Um, And and then we do um, a series of kind of tests and we pay attention to things that they may not realize that we're paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So we we just were looking for certain things that in person and how a person shows up and how they would represent our clients. And um, to get through our vetting process takes anywhere from three to five weeks to, to thoroughly get through it and make sure that my talent acquisition team has what they need in order to make a confident decision that they would represent our company well. So what do you look for on the resumes or maybe what's one tip that you would give somebody just general resume, you know, improvement tip? I I would say this is true regardless of where you're applying, not even, you know, even my, my company and or other companies that you would want to, um, you know, work for. I think, you know, Frankly, I don't put a lot of weight in resumes. Um, I'm looking more for passion. You know, do you really want to do this? And I know our team looks for that as well. It's like, you know, your cover letter actually means something. How you articulate yourself and your passion, if that shines through, it's a much easier kind of that one goes to the top of the pile in terms of, okay, this is a person I must talk to because it's clear to me that they're going to want to represent our company versus I just need a job. Or, um, you know, and we see this mistake happen a lot with, you know, stay at home moms and dads, 
they see the value and what it, and their benefit for that, but they fail and they articulate that really well that they want to work from home for their kids. But that can't be the reason for why we're in business as well. We need them to be, hey, look, my time is the opportunity to really help grow your company as well. And so it can't be so lopsided that the whole thing is just to benefit them and their family. They've got to communicate thoroughly that this is a win for us as a business as well. Hmm. And I see that mistake a lot. We get it. We understand. We're all parents. I, st- I left my job to, to have more time with my kids. I get it. But that doesn't pay bills. You know, really serving a company well and, you know, having that flexibility to, to, to be able to be a, a stay-at-home mom or dad, um, that's a, it's massively important as well. But it can't be the sole reason for why you want to work for a company. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Totally. So what's it, let's talk about you personally then. When you're interviewing for your executive assistant, what's the number one red flag that you kind of, you're like, uh-oh, this isn't right when you're interviewing an assistant? Um, well, you know, after six and a half years, my awesome assistant, Paige, um, decided she wanted to take on a new role inside of Belay, which is super cool. I love the fact that our company creates other opportunities for our assistants. And I had really worked for, with Paige, you know, for a good amount of the you know the life of our company. Um, and so I went out on a hunt for kind of our, our my next VA. And it turned out that actually my, my wife's um, assistant, her name is Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen decided to start her own company. And um, we found ourselves within about a month of each other of needing an assistant together. So we decided, let's, you know, hey, we're married. Our schedules are very similar. Let's see if we can't share one, which oftentimes I discourage people from doing. But knowing kind of our, our stage of life and the demands from us personally and, and our calendars and travel and so forth, We've actually made it work, um, but I don't recommend it for, you know, for leaders in general. Uh, but for us as a married couple, it, it seems to work. So to answer your question, um, I'm looking mostly for somebody that's highly detailed, that can anticipate my needs and um, is not intimidated by, you know, who I am or the role that that I sit in currently. And I know that sounds simple, but there's plenty of people that are, they, they make uh, a monster out of a molehill when the reality is, is I'm just a normal guy trying to grow a company and I need help on a day to day basis. And you're going to see the good, the bad and the ugly with me. And, uh, you know, it's just somebody that won't be intimidated by that at all. And my wife, I mean, she's a very um, successful businesswoman and, um, we just want somebody that can look past all that and say, Hey, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help your leadership, your family. I'm here to help grow belay. And, um, that, that's a very, I think very important thing. And just really anticipating needs. And that takes time. That's not an overnight thing. So you're looking for somebody that really wants to do that before they really get the opportunity to demonstrate it. So what's your favorite question to ask an assistant that you're interviewing? I haven't interviewed assistants in a long time uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis. I would say um, the bigger question for me, and it was the question I asked Hope, who is now our assistant. Um, and what's really cool about Hope, just if I could brag on her for a second, she's got, she actually was a relationship manager in our company before she became our assistant. So she coached assistants uh, as part of what she did for Belay before she became our assistant. And before that, she was um, the executive assistant to the CEO of J. Crew, and also the executive assistant to the CEO of Spanx. So a highly qualified individual in terms of what she could do. So, the, so the, the credibility was there. I wanted to ask her, why do you want to do this? You know, like, wh- why is this even attractive to you? Like, it's almost like, you're, you know, you're in a role where you're coaching and mentoring virtual assistants and you want to become one and just do that. And I think for her, that was just her sweet spot. And, and she is, she's so gifted at it. And I think that she's, she's really stepped into that role really well. But for me, I want to know the why, like why do this? Because Jeremy, as you know, I mean, oftentimes as an assistant, it's just a lot of serving. It's a lot of giving of yourself. It's a lot of doing things that, um, you know, you, you know, it's just like, you know, sometimes you feel like you're doing things into a black hole and 
uh, you know, that you've got to have some meaning behind why you do these things. And so that's what I want to get after when I, when I do ask people why you want to do these types of things. Hmm. So, you know, you mentioned she came from being a relationship manager and moved over to be you and Shannon's EA and right. some of your leadership team, I, I, if, you, if I remember right, are from your company in the sense that they started as virtual uh, assistants and then worked, yeah. kind of worked their way up. So how would you encourage uh, assistants who want to kind of progress in their career and eventually maybe even start or run their own company someday? So here's the cool thing about, I think, being an assistant. I hear this often and I disagree with it. I hear assistants when we talk and we, we hear this a lot from like, like um, hiring managers and larger corporations will say, you know, really what we're finding or what they're seeing is that these assistants are saying being an assistant is a dead end job. I couldn't disagree more. If there's ever a place where you could demonstrate leadership, it's in serving other people. <laughs> so that is true in our company. Do you remember earlier in this conversation, I talked about Trisha, who was my assistant at my old company. Mm -hmm. Today, she's the COO of our company. Yeah. At Belay. She's she one. She had a proven track record of serving and proving that she could get through things and execute so well that it just made sense as our business grew. She saw more and more responsibility come her way. And today I'm I, I mean, I literally, um, you know, Shannon and I are um, actually in the next uh, 11 days are going to take a 90 day sabbatical. And the person that we've appointed to run the company while we're out on sabbatical is Trisha. She's completely capable. She's a great leader. She knows how to execute. She knows how to, to oversee things, to mitigate risk. I mean, all the things that we need to have happen and represent us publicly too, she's able to do those things. So I don't look at a person in terms of their pedigree or where they went to school or all that. I think they're important, but they don't tell the whole picture. And I think, frankly, assistants, they need to realize that they actually have more influence than they realize that they can lead up, they can lead sideways in an organization, they can, they can lead in such a way that their serving of other people and an anticipating needs could be played out in a bigger, greater capacity for a business or for their own business if they want to create one. So what's the biggest mistake you've made when managing one of your assistants and what did you learn from the experience? You know, there, there is a fine line when you're working with somebody and it's professional and, and then it's private as well. You know, there's, there's a mix of things that our assistants do for us in terms of like, you know, helping us schedule a dentist appointment or maybe a personal vacation. I mean, all these things still have to get done. And, um, but there are times when you, when like you realize like, you know, I really, I probably need to take care of that thing, whatever that thing is on my own and not have my assistant do that. Although logically, you could argue like, well, that, you know, it's a higher payoff activity. I need to be the one that, you know, stay focused on my time. But I, I've made the mistake over time of sometimes giving a little too much personally for someone to do, um, you know, Paige uh, or Hope or Trisha even in the past and, and realizing like, you know, man, I probably should have taken that one on. And there's no book on how to be a great leader working with an assistant. I mean, that I know of, um, I mean, in terms of things like this, so you kind of have to figure things out when. You know, like you, you probably, um, you know, if, if you know, there, there might be like if you really want to get something meaningful for your wife, you probably should buy that yourself. <laughs> you know, like it's got You know, you can't just say, hey, you know, I want you to just figure this whole thing out and give my wife a great gift. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not going to work. If you're really in it for your for your wife, you're going to want to buy her that gift yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I've made some dumb mistakes like that before. Do you have a hobby and how important have you found this hobby to be in your sanity? <laughs> uh, right now, um, if I could categorize travel with my family as a hobby, uh, we are blessed to be in a, in a situation where we can do that now. And I think that that's kind of the current season where we are. And that, that gives us opportunities for new experiences. We, my wife and I have always said, we'd rather give our kids experience over things and right now they're 10 and 13 and it's a, obviously, a, you know, uh, many ages as a kid are very pivotal, but we're just finding that those experiences equal great dialogue, great conversation. Um, they get to see the world in a way that, um, I didn't get to see as a kid. Um, so right now I'd say that that, that is one thing that we're doing. Um, you know, around the house, we play a lot of Foursquare. 
and uh, you know shoot BB guns and play Xbox and um, my my daughter is quite the artist so we're always encouraging her with you know paint and drawing and so forth like that and she's also getting into more in drama so we, we're enjoying her activities at school and, and so forth and my son he's just now in the fourth grade so you know any stick he picks up is pretty much a gun which is which is awesome you know I love having a boy too so let's talk a little bit to leaders who don't have an assistant or maybe who do have one, but are trying to get more out of them or trying to improve that relationship. So first let's, let's, I want to ask you, what would you say to someone who doesn't have an assistant, but is considering hiring one, but they're not sure if they should. Well, I, and there's a couple things around this. So the first is a lot of leaders that don't have assistants. The reason why they don't is because they feel like to have an assistant would be a luxury hmm. and it's not. It's just not a luxury. In, in fact, it's a necessity if you plan on growing. I don't know anything great that happened with just one person. It takes an army of people moving in a specific direction for something great to occur. And for leaders, oftentimes, they've just not calculated their per hour rate. They've not figured out their daily rate or their hourly rate. And then, you know, it said like, okay, well, you know, let's say I make, you know, 500 bucks an hour doing whatever I do or whatever that number is for you. You know, you need to divide that by a lower number to really figure out what lower payoff activities are and higher payoff activities are because a good leader knows what their time is worth and then they delegate and give responsibility to other people to do those things that only they are that they can do that and then they get to focus on only the things that they can do. And I, I just see a lot of leaders, they miss that. They see it as a luxury. Um, and the other thing that I see oftentimes is it's more ego driven. It's like, well, I'm the only one that can do this thing. That's horse crap. That is not true. The truth is many, 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 many people can do things just as well as you. You've just chosen to hang on to it because you feel like you, it gives you worth in those things that you're doing. And we see that, you know, we see leaders that say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to finally be more open handed and realize that there's plenty of great people out there that can do these things. And, and what it does when the leader gets to that point, they actually elevate their leadership and they take their business to a new level. And it's really cool to watch. So on that theme, what's one practical tip that you would give executives to help them get more out of their assistance or give more to their assistants? What I would tell them is that, if they want to grow their team to the next level and themselves as leaders, they need to start delegating results, not tasks. Um, you know, we all work, well, hopefully we all work with people that are adults and those adults want to be trusted with results. And frankly, they can get to the result quicker than even I can or you can as a leader because they, they, they instinctively, intuitively know how to kind of go after a result. So it's not the 55 things that equal the result that you need to delegate to them. It's here's the result. And so they might, those 55 things that you've identified, they might be able to do them in 15 or 20 or 30, but not 55. And I just see a lot of leaders, they miss that. They want, they want to kind of methodically step by step, take people to what will one day be a result when they, what they really need to do is just say, Hey, here's the result I need from you. And I'm delegating this to you. I'm here to help you. But I want you to get after this result. And that's empowering people in such a powerful way. And a lot of leaders miss that. So which tasks have you seen assistants do that you would have never imagined that an assistant could handle? And maybe even specifically things that you never thought a virtual assistant would be able to handle because they're not there in the office. Yeah. Um, one of the more um, authentic ones that I've seen is where a leader will take um, a sheet of paper out and, and hand draw or hand write the alphabet and then take a picture of that and send it to their assistant. And then that assistant mimics their handwriting and does thank you notes for them, hmm. which I think is really cool personally. Um, because I mean, the words are coming to them in an email and all they're doing is they're basically just taking right out. Hmm. You know, that, that is one way to do it, especially when you've got a lot of thank yous to write because you're demonstrating gratitude. Um, that's that's more on the on the unique side. I think you know, frankly, I'm I've, I've been blown away by the, like the the ways or the methods in which you can um, oversee email. You know, I, I thought maybe there's one or two ways. There's actually like six or seven that we've identified how you can kind of manage a leader's email. 
Mm-hmm. And that's been really cool to see that evolve when we like, oh, hey, this is a new way to do it. It's pretty cool. Let's make sure we remember this. Um, because, you know, frankly, the things that we get hired a lot to do circle around the things that are, you know, um, you know, fairly boring, you know, like managing email, overseeing email, um, overseeing calendars. You know, it takes a special person to really want to be about those types of things. And um, I love it when we see innovation come out of those things. What's something your assistant does that an AI will never be able to do? Oh, man, what a great question. (laughs) You know, I think AI plays a very important part in the future of our industry. Um, And this is this is why I think that. Um, AI can especially, and, and, AI, and I will tell you this, I'm no expert in AI, but what I would say is AI is already helping our business because our assistants in certain cases are already leveraging it for things that they don't need to do, that they can kind of say, Hey, let's go ahead and automate this or let's do this thing. And assistants are already doing that. So for me, I think, um, assistants, especially they're wanting to kind of up their game in terms of productivity, need to pay close attention to what AI means for them personally in terms of their productivity. Um, we are certainly as a business looking at it and saying, okay, there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, what, what do we need to do to leverage this? You know, I don't think people will ever be replaced. I just don't. I think that, I think that there's things where, um, a certain level of critical thinking comes into play that, um, AI won't be able to calculate. I think that um, it'll take years and years and years of, um, of research and effort to get them to a place of higher level of sophistication with AI. Um, but I, I do think that in general, AI can be wonderfully leveraged with assistance, especially in certain activities that they do on an ongoing or consistent basis. So coming back to the whole virtual world, you wrote a book called Virtual Culture, The Way We Work Doesn't Work Anymore. What what do you have you seen is like the most valuable part, maybe other than, you know, spending time with your kids and flexibility. Um, but why why is allowing your employees to work from home valuable? You know, that that book for me was kind of like a cathartic experience because we um, we won an award um, for top company culture by Entre- Entrepreneur Magazine. And we took the number one spot on the list. And of the 50 companies that were listed, we were the only one that we knew that was all fully distributed or 100% remote. Hmm. And because of that, I got a lot of our company got a lot of notoriety. And I just felt like I needed to create a playbook for virtual companies or if you wanted to move in that direction. Now, hear me. It's not the playbook. It's a playbook. It's ours. And I wanted to share that because we just got to ask a lot like, hey, how in the world are you doing this? And so it was my attempt to kind of share the, you know, behind the curtain of how Belay operates. Um, what's been most rewarding for me, frankly, is hearing companies that have wrestled through this book and their leadership teams have read this book and then digested it and said, okay, well, if this is true and if this is how workforce is moving, what does that mean for our business? And getting a lot of cool letters and um, emails and messages on LinkedIn and, and, you know, people calling saying, hey, you know, this this book changed our, our industry or excuse me, changed our, not our industry, our company. Um, it means a great deal to me personally. It's not, um, it doesn't bring us necessarily any money. And, you know, it's not a service. So I don't consult on this, um, but it's, it's brought awareness to Belay, which has been really great um, as we continue to grow and scale up our company. So what are the cons to having remote workers? You know, um, I found one about two months ago and, um, there's, there's a couple, but I, I'd say this one was a new one that I discovered that I'll share. Um, hard conversations that you know, you need to have, you get to the finality or the conclusion of it. I think quicker when you're face to face in person. Uh, while Zoom is amazing technology and we leverage it every single day in our business at Belay, uh, there's just something to be said about being in the same room when you need to have a really hard conversation. Hmm. And, um, you know, because we're fully distributed, that's not just as easy. You know, sometimes that requires an airplane and a hotel stay. 
you know, but um, that is one thing that I've realized when you when when the conversations beyond productivity, when the conversations beyond just doing things that you know are business related, when you when you need to go deeper and really get at the heart of something, and maybe that conversation is going to trend in a very hard direction. I think it's important that you're there face to face, and um, I, I do I do see that as a drawback. You know, and I'm pro you know remote company, <laughs> big time, but there are times when you just need to be face to face with someone. That's a good point. So what would you tell an EA who wants to become a VA who wants to, or maybe a traditional in office EA who wants to become a remote work from home VA? Um, I would say that they're moving in the right direction in terms of what I, what I'm personally seeing as the workforce of the next generation or the, or at least the next decade. We're seeing just a lot of people that want to work from home because they've got a friend that works out their back deck already. And they're working in a company that's got great benefits. Um, that's all remote or mostly remote. And then, frankly, I'm seeing a lot of organizations where um, of size that are saying, okay, a certain percentage of our company by such and such goal or deadline will be fully distributed or remote. And it's just the way it's heading. I, if, if I were in commercial real estate today, I'd be scared silly. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of old office carcasses um, as a result of the shift um, in, in terms of space because people and businesses are realizing people don't need to actually come and work in an office anymore, that they can actually produce great results for a company and they can all be done from home. So I would say as an assistant, if you're doing things like on site right now and in, in more of a kind of a traditional capacity, maybe you sit outside the door of your your leader, there's a day coming where for you, I think it's going to be completely unnecessary for you to be there. You can be doing this and working from home. So I, if you want that, I would be proposing that to your leader already and helping them realize that like, this is, this saves them money. This saves them, you know, net profit, which is important, obviously to owners, you know, by them being able to work from home. So should virtual assistants specialize or should they be more a jack of all trades? Uh, that's a tricky question. I think some of that's really industry specific. Um, but I think if you're, you know, if you're wanting to get in a particular lane or industry then I would definitely encourage them to specialize and really know that space super well. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of great people out there that, you know, they're general practitioners, if you will. And they're in a particular city in the United States or anywhere, and they've just got four clients and they're super happy. Hmm. You know, that's, that's a great way to, you know, um, have a great, you know, personal career outside of working for a company, including ours. You know, we, we see that a lot where, you know, some really great assistant in Albuquerque has got four clients that she does assistant work for in Albuquerque, you know, and it, and it just works and she's paid well and it, it meets needs for her family. And, you know, that, that is a way to do it for sure. So let's close with, the final question, what can assistants do to become better leaders? I think that they can become a better leader by recognizing that serving people is leadership. And the more that they can understand the topic um, around servant leadership and then apply that as a principle in terms of how they work, they'll quickly find themselves being given more leadership opportunities. And, uh, you know, if one thing I would say for any assistant is become an expert in the topic of servant leadership, you know, Robert Greenleaf wrote a great essay, kind of the, the granddaddy, if you will, of servant leadership, um, that I would encourage people to read. It's called the servant as leader. Ken Blanchard has wrote tons of stuff on servant leadership. Um, but I would become a student of servant leadership because if you do that, well, what's going to happen is you're going to be presented with other opportunity to, to do things or lead in ways that maybe are less administrative and more leadership oriented. And I can't think of a better way to lead than be a servant leader. And a servant leader, by the way, isn't a person that just lays down and lets people walk on. A servant leader, it was modeled like in what I saw in Jesus. And a lot of servant leadership topics, they talk about that. Um, you know, there's, there's a strong will that's imposed when you serve because you're making a decision to serve people. And that might mean, Hey, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to hide behind things or, Hey, I'm going to model this because this is important for the direction we're going and you need to follow me. And by following me, I'm serving you. 
So there's there's some really great things I think that that assistants would benefit by becoming experts in servant leadership. They'll if they do that, they'll they'll find that plenty of opportunity is going to come their way. Great, totally agree. Awesome man. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Is there is there something that my listeners can do to support what you're doing, or maybe where can they find you online? Well, we always love an attaboy or we're cheering you on type of stuff on social media. Um, as of late, we're pretty big um, on, on Instagram. That seems to be a really great platform for us for these days. Um, we're pretty active still um, with regard to Facebook. So we love hearing dialogue back and forth, um, both Belay. And if you want to look us up with our um, our handles, it's Belay Solutions um, for Instagram and also for Facebook. And then for me personally and my wife, we're on Facebook. We've got a, a profile page where we interact quite a bit with folks. And then we're on Instagram as well. Um, those are really great places just to kind of see what we're up to as a business and us personally as, as owners of this company. Um, and we, we love um, engaging with folks, um, you know, in, in different capacities. So that would be way. And, of course, our website's available if you're just curious about our company and what we do at BelaySolutions.com. And then um, my virtual culture book, um, while it can be found like on Amazon, if you want to read more about the book itself, it's just virtualculturebook.com. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. I'll put all those links in the show notes so everybody can get to them easily. And yeah, thanks again for joining us. Been a great conversation. Uh, Hope you have a great week and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jeremy. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again for listening. Check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com forward slash 32. Until next time, have a good one. Please review on Apple Podcasts. Gobullos.com